Network, along with the Social Action Club of St. Thomas College Autonomous Trishul, the Learning City, is hosting the seventh international lecture under the collaborative efforts of GlobalX, the Kerala State Higher Education Council, and Kerala Economic Association. We are honored to have with us today our distinguished guests, Dr. Rasmus Lemma from the United Nations University, Dr. Krishnan Sivi of Sri Lagam Lifelong Learning Institute, Dr. Ajit Kalyat from Kerala Institute of Local Administration, Mr. Akhil Kurian from Vibrant Community Action Network. Dr. Joy Element, the Director, of General, Director General of KILA, will also be joining us shortly. Um, it is a proud moment as we welcome all our invited guests, faculty members, and students from various institutions in and around Trishul. Your participation here shows us your commitment towards education and your belief in the power of knowledge. Uh, we shall begin with a prayer by Ms. Navya M. of First Year BA Economics. invite Mr. Emmanuel Thomas, head of the Department of Economics and coordinator of the program, to formally welcome the gathering. Dear friends, at the outset, let me uh, begin by welcoming all of you to this program. All it began with uh, Dr. Rasmus Lemma uh, from the United Nations University uh, accepting an invitation from the Kerala Economics Association to deliver a lecture at the Department of Economics of St. Thomas College, Trishul. On uh, after uh, you know completing his uh, annual Globalix conference at Trivandrum. Mm -hmm. So we are thankful to uh, Dr. K.J. Joseph of Gulati Institution and uh, the office where is President and Secretary of Kerala Economics Association for making this happen, Dr. Hari K. N. Harilal and uh, Dr. Sandosh T. Varghese. Now when uh, we got this opportunity, we discussed about the possible ways of organizing this program at the department. And then we thought that we should make the most of this opportunity. And then comes the second part. Uh, about a, a month ago, three faculty members from our college, from three departments, Department of Social Work, Department of Statistics, and uh, the Department of uh, Economics. We had together prepared a project to present at the Sri Lakam in a competition organized by the Sri Lakam uh, uh, Lifelong Learning Institute at CHERP. <coughs> and uh, it was a competition which was organized in the context of uh, 
UNICEF, sorry, UNESCO Learning City project of Trishur. And uh, we, uh, Dr. Rani Sebastian of, of uh, the Department of Statistics, uh, along with a student from our college, made the presentation there. And uh, we bagged the first prize. And uh, uh, one of the important components of uh, the project that we proposed there was related to bringing uh, experts, world-class professors, to Trishur, to our institutions here, and uh, giving more exposure to our students and faculty. So that was one of the ideas. It was a, a big comprehensive project. And one of the ideas was this. And we are thankful to Dr. C. V. Krishnan, uh, for, uh, who is the founder of this Sri Lagam institution, for organizing this, for making this, this competition and making this uh, possible. So that is about how it began. So then, instead of uh, organizing it as a program of uh, one department, we thought these three departments can combine together along with another club, social action club of our college. And we decided to rope in as many institutions as possible into this program. So there were other participants in that competition. So they, we decided to invite them also to this program. Many of, I think all the institutions are represented here in this program. So, uh, uh, then uh, now, after telling you the context, uh, Dr. Rasmus will be speaking to us on green transition. Green transition is a very important uh, idea, uh, a, a major challenge which we are all going to face in the future. So he works in the area of gr green transition of uh, the global south. How the economies in the south can go through this transition to make it very simple for the students, uh, yesterday, Dr. Rasmus and uh, his wife, Stine, they were telling me that they do not own a car in Denmark. They are making use of uh, public transport system. But now, what is the situation in Kerala? We are all trying to buy bigger and bigger cars. So now, when are we going to reach that stage? To give one example. So this is the transition that is, going, that is required. So he is, I think, working on these possible transition paths with least cost for the environment and, co and for the economy. So it, uh, we will hear from him, more, ab more about this from him. So now, uh, why is it going to be important for, in, in, for Kerala to speak about this? We are in the global south. And, uh, we have this much acclaimed, much talked about uh, uh, Kerala model, which is uh, facing a lot of uh, criticism, a lot of debates are going on around it, especially around the sustainability of this model. So how can Kerala go forward? It is going to be a big challenge. And now recently Kerala is discussing a lot about uh, mass uh, exit of students from our society. Many students are going out. Earlier it was after their post-graduation or graduation. Now many of them are uh, going for, you know, leaving the state just after completing their 10th standard or 12th standard. So how to address these kind of issues? Is it a real problem? What, what are the problems that these kind of phenomena are going to make post for a state like ours? So these are issues worth discussing. And uh, in the context of this green transition, you know, the world is facing a big uh, challenge. As all of us know, the, the, this global warming and climate change are a reality. We cannot ignore. Even Kerala is nowadays of late experiencing extreme climate events, could, which could be a sign of this global warming and uh, uh, climate change, which the whole world is experiencing everywhere. You know, Western Europe is facing, suddenly there will be a flash flood in Germany. You know, we can, we are uh, this, uh, seeing this. So, and along with this problem on the climate front, environment front, 
the world is facing so many other problems also you must be we all we are all aware of the geo strategic you know issues that are happening nowadays the recent weeks especially you know the the period after covid we are facing so much of problems in the world politics so these are posing the riots are happening in western europe can you imagine so aggression wars are rising i am not uh, painting a dark picture but we have to be aware of what is happening in the world so in this context can kerala continue to rely on a model where we continue to send our people to other societies instead of fixing the problem set at at our place i think we need to put our house in order we need to do that at the earliest i think the learning city project can be a starting point for that addressing the issues at home we cannot continue this we need to have a better kerala we deserve a better kerala and uh, i hope that this learning city project will bring in lot of changes and it need it should not be it cannot be limited to thrissur alone because a small project in a locality cannot make changes in the whole state it, so it has to become a a, a state wide project for sure so this learning city project is offering uh, an opportunity as well as a challenge i feel the opportunity is that see this, this is a, just an example of what we can do thrissur is rich in terms of institu education institutions you just look at the see when we brainstorm dr jijo kuruvela rani sebastian and myself when we discuss we found that there are too many uh, education institutions in thrissur universities agricultural university veterinary university uh, we have engineering college medical college what not so many of them uh, kala mandalam is there how many institutions are there sahitya academy lalita kala academy what is the synergy networking that we can create out of this presence of these institutions we should think about it so i think that if we can uh, build on this and uh, transform our state in the future then uh, we will have you know a we can create a better uh, tomorrow so this is uh, and what is the challenge part of this unesco learning project unesco learning project if we focus on some ad hoc things some small small uh, aspects then what will happen is that <coughs> you know our people will take advantage of these opportunities and make use of that platform to go out of the state so it has to be accompanied by change institutional changes in in kerala otherwise it will not work so along with this uh, unesco learning project where we focus on many many aspects in thrissur and in kerala we need to press for the academia the student community the learning community need to argue for serious changes in governance in ensuring better democratic processes in ensuring more accountability in ensuring more uh, better institutions in our state otherwise this will continue so this is overall context in which this uh, this conference this symposium is organized so let me uh, without wasting much time let me move on to the duty of welcoming all of you to this program we will listen to we have to listen to the speakers uh, first uh, we will be listening to dr rasmus he is uh, a faculty member of uh, united nations university merit merit focuses on comprehensive innovation uh, with a special focus on sustainability so that is what i understand we will listen to him and learn more about that and uh, uh he was uh, it was extremely kind of him and uh, his wife stine to accept our invitation and everybody who has been working behind the scenes thanks a lot okay so uh with those words what will i be talking about uh we have been debating a little bit back and forth about that uh, initially the idea was that i would be giving a one hour lecture on on the topic which is on the screen but in fact we we thought it would be more useful if i do a condensed version of uh, of this and then 
we will leave much more time for interactive discussions, questions uh, from the floor, uh, and so on. I will also have uh, a, a few uh, questions uh, with regards to, to the Learning City. I don't know much about the program, uh, so what I will be doing uh, in terms of the first uh, question is to talk about my own work, as I mentioned. What is all the fuss about green late comma development? I think I can give a, a relatively clear answer to that, concise. With respect to the second question, is it relevant to the learning city? Uh, there, it's much more tentative. Uh, but I, I do think that perhaps some of the underlying ideas of what I will be talking about could be relevant in the discussion of, of the learning city. And I will also have uh, just a few uh, comments with respect to what it could mean in, in terms of, of higher education. So uh, some food for thought and for, for, for the continuing discussion. So the first part uh, builds on many years of work. Um, I have been working in the field of, of green transformations for uh, at least 10 years. Uh, over the last two or three years, very much concerned around this concept of, of green windows of, of opportunity. And uh, why is that notion of an opportunity important? For me, for many years, uh, a lot of the stance in the Global South was about how greening is an extra cost. It's a burden. And absolutely, there's also truth to that. In many cases, uh, the green transformation comes with extra requirements in terms of export markets. You don't uh, just have to produce your goods, you also have to do it uh, in a green way. There are additional taxes being imposed also in, in lead markets in the European Union, where I'm from. We now have the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, for, for countries from outside. All of that uh, is incurring uh, an extra cost. If we're thinking about the transformation to renewables, I will be talking about that a lot. That also comes with huge investments. So there has been quite a hesitance to engage uh, wholeheartedly in, in the green transformation uh, debate. And, and as I said, for good reasons. But the point here is to say, this is something, as Emmanuel pointed out, it's something which is happening uh, globally. It's something that economies of the global south need to think about and react to. So what could be uh, the opportunities? And thinking of, of, of those questions, I've been working. Uh, uh, the, the, the first picture here is from a special issue in a journal called Industrial and Corporate Change, where we put together uh, lessons from, from China in renewables. I will be talking uh, about that uh, quite, quite some, uh, at quite some, some length within my short speech. Uh, then also um, thinking outside China, thinking about other sectors than renewables. I mean, the green uh, economy, the green transformation, renewables are very central to that, but of course it covers a broad variety of, of technologies and, and sectors and so on. So this is something that we've been working together with UNCTAD, which is the United Nations Conference on, on Trade and Development, their technology and innovation report from this year, where a lot of those ideas are, are collected and um, it's available online. I, I would encourage you to, to have a look. So as I mentioned, how are the Global South going to deal with, face, respond to, strategize in terms of, of the green transformation. And now many of you uh, will probably have heard about the, the, the Kuznets model. Many of you have studied uh, and are studying uh, economics. So the Kuznets model, uh, the idea that as economies grow, they become more unequal. This is, has been empirically observed in, in many, many places. As they become more developed, inequality reduces. That was a hypothesis. It was um, uh, something uh, uh, observed. Then that idea transformed into the environmental Kuznets curve, which means that as economies grow, they become dirtier, more polluted, 
uh, and as they become more developed, of course, then um, uh, pollution is reduced. That is less of basically an established fact. It's an idea, um, but it has formed a lot of, of, of thinking about the relationship between economic growth and environmental, um, um, I environmental effort. So the idea behind this uh, uh, Kusnets curve is also what is uh, behind this idea, which is over here, which says, you know, you grow first and you clean up later. And there are actually quite uh, substantial arguments I in favor of this. So, for instance, you might have uh, in polluting industries a lot of uh, uh, workers, a lot of uh, industries, entrepreneurial activities, and so on. And you retain your employment. If you wait a little bit uh, with, with the greening process, so for instance, uh, take the case of South Africa, think about all the workers which are uh, right now facing problems in the industries around coal mining. So the greening effort there comes with a lot of social uh, problems and unrest. So waiting with the greening effort will avoid some of those. There's also, of course, opportunity costs in terms of, of the green transformation. Those <coughs> uh, economic costs couldn't, can be uh, allocated for, for social purposes. And there's also the very important point that if you wait a little bit, <coughs> then there will be economic uh, and technological uh, development elsewhere, which leads to technologies that can be implemented at a much cheaper cost once they are uh, mature. So that is why there's actually quite a, a, a number of things in, in favor of waiting. On the other hand, then, as I said, the, the Kuznets curve is not uh, something which is, is given from above. It's something where you have influence over that. And there's also uh, uh, quite a number of arguments in favor of greening now. First, it lowers the cost of switching from, let's say, a dirty transformation pathway to a cleaner transformation pathway. Once um, the the... the dirty transformation pathway becomes more entrenched, the cost of switching away from that also, of course, then increases. We have the issue of, of asset stranding. Again, thinking about uh, the energy sector, many of the assets in involved in, in, in the energy sector, they have a lifetime of 20, 30, even longer years. So if you invest in a coal-fired power plant at the moment, is that asset going to be worth something uh, down the future, this is something which is uh, in my country from Denmark, something which is uh, a, a real issue and having uh, influence on, on investment decisions. Also, uh, and many environmental innovations, they come with efficiency gains that also improve uh, competitiveness on their own. They have an immediate effect and also there are early mover advantages. So when you build up green capabilities, those can be used uh, in, in terms of competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other country. Uh, and, and also, quite importantly, there's so much going on, and I will come back to that, uh, in the institutional domain about preferential access to uh, uh, different kinds of capital, to networks, to consultancy services, and all those other uh, initiatives which are um, uh, in, in globally in, in, in support of green transformation. So uh, clearly what, uh, w what we are arguing in, in our work is that greening now comes with uh, bigger advantages uh, as opposed to uh, growing first and cleaning up later. And then thinking about the green economy, uh, economic development, technological change, innovation issues, it's a very different scenario. It's a very different setting from many other uh, uh, kinds of sectors and domains where we think about economic development. And why is that? For, for the reasons that you see on the screen here. The green economy, by definition, is right now in an era of ferment. It is something which is being formed. It's, some, uh, it's a domain with lots of uncertainty, lots of experimentation, 
thinking out of the box and new opportunities. And also, it means that you know, some of those established pathways, established models of development, where in the past you could say, well, if we want to develop, we want to do what South Korea did. It's, it's a clear pathway, let's copy that model. No, you cannot do that, because basically it, it was uh, a dirty and, and highly polluting model, so South Korea is right now themselves thinking about how to transform, again, uh, being uh, uh, sort of entrenched uh, in a model, and, and, and changing away from that pathway is costly. We are dealing with public goods, uh, driven by social value, uh, <clears throat> and that means that the dynamics around this and the dynamics around economic policy for that are, are different. So your opportunities for uh, industrial policy around uh, uh, public goods uh, are, are different from, from many other sectors. Related to this fact that we are talking about direct development, per definition, lots of public policy uh, involvement. And uh, as I mentioned, we are in a field of, of global agenda with a Paris Agreement and all of these arrangements uh, around it. So these sets of circumstances makes the case of economic development here uh, um, very different. We have been trying to think about that uh, in terms of what we then call green windows of opportunity. So <clears throat> what you see in the slide here is, the, is in the picture, in the diagram, a way to think about different specific sectors in the green economy and, and, and how change unfolds and how that can lead to economic development opportunities. Huh? So the drive, the institutional drive, the new ways that investors are thinking, uh, the new strategies of cooperation and, and so on, all of that are, are, are changing and creating different kinds of, of disruption, what we call the green windows of opportunity, in the economic domain, institutional domain, uh, and in terms of, of shifting markets. Those opportunities are there, but you cannot turn them into uh, to reality uh, automatically. It, it requires effort. So we are thinking about what we call innovation systems around those opportunities. And that means that you have, in the sexual system, which is then down below, you have private uh, uh, sector uh, organizations, you have public sector organizations, and they have different preconditions and different responses. So even though if we're thinking about global opportunities, the ability to respond will differ between co countries, of course, um, but the ability to uh, respond is not just dependent on your precondition, but also depending, uh, depending on your willingness on your foresight and ambition. So that's an important uh, point that we have also observed. That and, uh, then in terms, if, if it's effective, uh, leads to different kinds of, of upgrading, we can call it. Here we call it catching up, but we can think about it simply in terms of economic development, uh, or more broadly. So these opportunities, they are not there uh, forever, they are time bound. As I said, it's an era of ferment, so there's a lot of dynamism going uh, on at the moment. It creates these disruptions, opportunities, that will, uh, that will disappear. Also very important is, is the fact that these opportunities, they ha have an external element, but very often they are also very much internally determined. So you can do much as a country, as a sector, uh, as a municipality to boost, uh, boost this opportunity. Huh? You, can, you can open it with different kinds of policies. As I mentioned, uh, again, uh, for, for, for the energy sector, feed-in tariffs and so on, creates a market. But how is your own sexual system around that market responding? You need coordination uh, uh, to, to exploit that. Let me try to illustrate this uh, uh, idea of an opportunity with uh, an example, just briefly. One case we have been looking at quite uh, extensively is the case of the, the Chinese electric vehicle sector. And if we think about cars from China, that sector has been trying 
for many, many years to uh, gain an export market. The combustion engine vehicles, they are very successful inside China, but when it comes to, uh, to the export markets, there was really very little, uh, um, very little uh, success with, with uh, opening up those. Then comes what we call a, a techno-economic paradigm shift at the sectoral level, so the shift from combustion engine engines to electric vehicles. It's, of course, a shift which is still ongoing, but a very important one. That created opportunities for the Chinese uh, uh, um, sector, the automotive sector, to integrate uh, a software, integrate different capabilities, reverse engineers, the Teslas, and, and what have you. And that then opened that uh, opportunity, which means that if you look at my own country in, in Denmark, Scandinavia, Germany, many other places, the share of Chinese electric vehicles, the, the sales of those are just skyrocketing. So this is uh, just to show that there's something different uh, under the sun, and many of those established, the incumbents, are, diff are, are slow, basically, to move on this. More, uh, more you could call it, n nimble sexual systems uh, in China is able to move on this. Okay, I need to speed up uh, just slightly, aiming to end in, in about five minutes. Again, we looked at quite uh, a number of uh, renewables from China. What we saw was that when it comes to all of these sectors that you see here on, on the slide, I'm not going to, to go through that. Maybe we can come back to it in the discussion. But uh, all of these in China, solar PV, wind, hydro, concentrated solar power, biomass, and so on, they have started from a position of, of backwardedness, but in a space of a very short, very short time span. For, for the wind energy sector, we're talking about a time span of 10 to 15 years, coming from no production capabilities at all, moving to not the exact forefront, but still moving uh, to, to the stage where you can compete in international markets. And uh, why is that? Well, parts of it, as I said, it can be endogenously created with uh, with uh, laws, and there has been huge promotion in terms of, of, of market creation in, in China. There has been mission uh, orientation, which means that you not only create that market, but you also support the supply side. And in terms of the trajectory, um, what you could see was that a lot of those, the, the initial projects were from outside. They were parts of of, of different um, kinds of technology transfer and, and investment uh, programs, uh, climate investment programs, so preferential access to, to capital and to uh, consultancy services and so on, like the clean development mechanism. From that, learning initially from those projects, building up slowly your own capability, so not just uh, uh, installing the, the, the turbines, but understanding how they work not immediately becoming uh, an OEM in that space, but uh, initially developing some suppliers of components, understanding how the technology works, over time being able to put together complete uh, turbines. At the same time, uh, implementing uh, industrial policies, so for instance, uh, local content requirements, saying that if you want to compete uh, in this market, also as a, as a foreign company, you do need to rely on uh, on your local components. So over time, you, you then see the Chinese companies moving up to, uh, to the forefront stage. Many other uh, examples uh, uh, from across the world, it's not just China, in the case of biogas in Thailand, also uh, very interesting. Of course, what is, is key here is that there are also many, many cases where it's a missed opportunity, where uh, where there has been attempts to, to try to do this, use this greening as an economic development opportunity, but failing to do so. Uh, I'm just mentioning uh, one example here uh, of the re um, Renewable Independent Power Producer Program in, uh, in, in South Africa. They've been trying to implement same, some of the same kind of industrial strategies for, for China, but did not succeed. 
So in that uh, case, what you do is you create a market, subsidized market, which is completely co captured by, uh, by companies from the outside. This is not what you want. What is uh, interesting from, from uh, the perspective also of what we might be discussing a bit later is that many of these cases are ones where you start with the effort to address different kinds of societal challenges, not least local air pollution. Uh, for, for the case of China, that was a key driver, not just for the electric vehicles, also for all the renewables and many other uh, spaces. Um, your commitment to live up to the, climate, to, the, to the Paris Agreement, and so on. This is something that is in the public interest, but that also creates opportunities. So uh, th this is uh, one, one key point, that addressing these societal challenges can, of course, have these economic benefits. And, and it's about creating what we call these co-benefits uh, of this transformation, which is the key. Okay, I will be very brief here. Uh, one takeaway uh, is that, uh, as I mentioned, it's not just about looking for external, scanning external opportunities, it's also about endogenously creating them. Uh, seizing them depends on a lot of state capacity, a lot of convening power, and it's really about sequencing. So. Uh, for instance, when I was talking about a, a local content requirement, is that something that you do want? But you also need kind of sunset clauses. So for the case of China, it was in place in five years. Uh, once they removed it, the, the objectives w was achieved. So it's about dynamic policy making. And it's really about coordination across policy domains. As I mentioned several times, about coordination, demand and supply side. So co-designing uh, of policies also in terms of co-designing environmental policy, industrial policy, uh, higher education policy, and so on. It has to uh, come together. Okay, um, this I, I will uh, not talk about. I'm hoping that we will uh, get some introduction. It was just for my own sake, putting together a, a little bit of uh, overview. What is this uh, Learning City uh, treasure actually about? Um, and uh, extremely interesting, I think, uh, initiatives and, and objectives, also covering a range of, of different kinds of domains, uh, and indeed uh, um, sustainable development goals, those related to quality education, uh, and also urban, urban planning and, and development, sustainable cities and communities. So some of the questions that, that I would like to, uh, to discuss, one issue is about, in all the material that I looked at, uh, the, the term sustainability is mentioned quite a number of times. What exactly are sustainability skills? What does it mean in, in, in the context of, of Trisha? Is it the kinds of sustainability skills that relate to what I've been talking about? Not really. They are of a different kind. But can we still think about you know, addressing sustainability issues and combining that with uh, some opportunities for just more than sustainability? That's one question. I also note that the program is, is covering quite a number of different domains. Uh, I, I showed, uh, so the banking sector was there, uh, jewelry was there, small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, waste management, and so on. That's a lot of things to, to cover, I think, in one program. Um, so again here, there's a dilemma between going broad across all of these domains and going deep within a few of them. Are there opportunities to think about some of these in terms of the societal uh, challenges and <coughs> define what we can call mission-oriented approaches around those? An interesting thing uh, about sort of mission uh, approaches is that you can bring together a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different uh, uh, NGOs, companies, public sector organizations across domains. So you can I imagine uh, small and medium sized enterprises and uh, uh, the financial uh, sector and so on coming together around uh, waste management models, for instance. 
And again, as I have been talking about, is it possible to think about these kinds of initiatives that are not only addressing to ch challenges, but also might have opportunities for what I call co-benefits. That's in terms of organizational, technological learning, job creation, entrepreneurial activity, supply chain development, and so on. Where are these potential spaces uh, uh, here? Then just a, a final very short note on, on higher education. I think that what I was just mentioning now um, could call for an approach which is called problem-based learning. So we will hear uh, uh, later about lifelong learning. Problem-based learning is particularly suited for, for the types of initiatives that I, I was just talking about. It's a different kind of setting up your educational programs, a different uh, way of developing curricula, where these uh, problems are at the forefront and where you try to align your educational uh, initiatives with those. And it means also thinking about who are the stakeholders. So in a way, getting much closer to the stakeholders of different kinds of, of uh, uh, societal problems uh, in this uh, in this learning city projects. Not only in terms of external openness, but also in terms of internal openness. Now we already saw that uh, this learning city project led to some new collaboration between faculties. And that is typically how it is. When you think about framing uh, your educational initiatives and, and thinking about the role of higher education in this respect, it's clear that all of these types of problems have multiple dimensions where you cannot just address from the perspective of economics. So that's why you now have collaboration between economics, social work, to, to think about this. And this is exactly uh, uh, what is needed uh, in problem-based uh, uh, problem uh, learning. So I hope that uh, idea is clear. Maybe we can discuss a little bit more about what it implies in, in practical terms. And I also just want to to advertise uh, and mention to you that there could be opportunities for linking up uh, with the, the Learning City project with uh, this institution based in Denmark, which is also part of the UNESCO system, which is the UNESCO chair in, in problem-based learning. Um, I, I know some of them and they are very, very open to collaboration and, and can be a great resource. So with that, uh, let me thank you once again and uh, it's been a pleasure to, to talk to you. I, I just look forward to the discussion. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Rasmus. Uh, in fact, uh, he modified his presentation for our, uh, our program. Uh, he is, generally the presentations are very technical and uh, we had a discussion at Trivandrum at the sidelines of the Global East Conference. He, and uh, there too, he was very busy. He is a vice. He is the vice president of Globalix, and uh, it's a, a huge network of uh, uh, academicians working in the area of innovation, technology, collaborations, etc. So, in spite of that busy schedule, he modified and he even uh, prepared a couple of slides in the context of Trishul Learning City. So, thank you very much for uh, putting your thoughts into this and uh, this presentation. Now, uh, Dr. Joy Element has come, and uh, he is on his way to to Kila from the airport. He is coming from Delhi. Uh, so I had already told you about uh, Dr. Joy Element. So once again, on behalf of this program and St. Thomas College, sir, we extend a warm welcome to you to this program. So please ch continue to. I mean, please chair the session now. And uh, our plan is like uh, we will open up the floor for we will take a few questions now for five minutes maybe because Dr. Christian is waiting online. So we will have a five minutes discussion followed by these three presentations. Thank you, sir. Now. I think uh, now the floor is open for questions. Uh, we will take three questions. I mean, after the, his presentation. So or to you. you can raise your hands and then they will help you <coughs> yeah
anyone My name is Shibu. I'm working as an assistant professor at the Department of Development Studies, Calicut University. So, a country like India, it is on a takeoff stage. So, like uh, you were talking about the South Korean model, which was very, uh, they have shifted from uh, manufacturing to sophisticated goods in late 70s. So, initially, uh, like con uh, country like India is now taking stage. If we uh, change, uh, move to uh, green, if uh, we change our technology and uh, taken to green, so it will cost a lot. And so we should gradually move to the uh, approaching later on or like gradually partially changing few into greens. Then after a long, like a long uh, run, we can close to the total green. Like uh, there should be like hydro a clean energy moving rather than electric to a clean energy so what do you think on it and i ho hope sir uh, green uh, shifting to green will enhance trade with euro and india most of the european country do appreciate on green energy so it will boost india's export gradually so what do you think on it so uh, uh, rather than uh, quickly adopting to green whether sh it should wait to a drive to maturity period like yeah, we are on a takeoff stage, like after 10 to 20 years, it will be a drive to maturity stage. So, what do you think on it? Good morning, sir. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name myself Kavya. I'm a first PG student at St. Thomas Economics Department. So my question is quite similar to what Sir has asked earlier. So my question is, the discussion about climate change has started since 1979. And uh, you mentioned that there has been a hesitance for green transformation by the developed countries. So I would like to know the economic concept uh, aspect of it. And then again, you also talked about grow first and then we'll clean up later. So is that uh, what is happening? Do, uh, is it due to that there is this hesitance for green transformation? Like we grew first and now cleaning up later is a hassle. Is that because of this habit? Because it has turned into a habit. And another question is that uh, you said both of us, uh, both is expensive on its own terms. So uh, which is more affordable for a growing economy like India? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, quite related questions, uh, in fact. Um, well, let me let me start with the, I guess, the, the, the last part of, of your question, uh, which is about collaboration between India and the EU. And I think at the moment there are windows of opportunity for deepening that uh, relationship. We uh, usually had a huge delegation from, from my own uh, country of Denmark. I, I work in the Netherlands. Uh, but, but live in Denmark, um, to discuss areas around uh, uh, green technologies. Huh? But it's not just in what we can call the green economy. It's also in the rest of the economy where greening is, is becoming much more uh, important. So as I said, you know, the, um, the requirements that are being implemented now in, in the European market Greening is becoming mainstreamed, so uh, uh, thinking about uh, those elements will be absolutely key. And there's an opening because basically what is going on between the U.S. and China, the EU and China, I think uh, um, opportunities for, for deepening relationships uh, are, are there at the moment. Um, so that, that's uh, one part of the answer. Um, the other part of the answer is when it comes to, uh, yes, uh, the cost, and that also is also uh, what is there. My, my firm view is that not responding in time is going to be much more costly. Much more costly, and that's why, uh, as I mentioned, it's about embarking uh, 
on the greening process if, when, and where it makes sense. So it's not something that can be done uh, uh, across the board. It's about selecting specific domains where indeed uh, uh, it can be, uh, can be done uh, in a less costly way uh, and, and, and building on those. And I think also uh, part of what you were asking was uh, related to, to, to the energy sector. And of course, what is key for the energy sector is that once you have renewables installed, the, the fuel of that is for free. But uh, the, in, the upfront investment cost uh, absolutely is, is, is immense. And more than that, it's also a question of, of, of engineering because bringing all of these uh, uh, renewables onto the grid is a huge challenge uh, that, that has to be dealt with, more so in, in, in uh, some places than others. And what is sometimes being called a smart grid has immense opportunities, again, for efficiency gains beyond just uh, um, 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 beyond the renewable space as, as such. Now, then comes to who, who is going to supply those, who is going to supply the renewables. And that is, of course, a, a key issue. As I understand it, the Indian National Solar Mission has been less successful in reaping what I have called the economic co-benefits of this. As I understood it, uh, a lot of those, I, I saw so many uh, solar parks uh, coming on the train here uh, the, other, um, the other day, uh, coming from, from yesterday from, from south, passing all of these, these panels. What I have heard is that the, most of the panels being supplied in India are from China. And of course, this is exactly the kind of policy failure that, that you don't want, and that's why what I was talking about, the co-designing of these policies are, are so important. Um, I think for, for wind, it is uh, more or less the, 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 the same story. I remember uh, many years back, I was hearing about this Indian company called Suslan, uh, which had some initial success, but I think um, somehow it disappeared, which is due to the fact, I think, that there was a company, but it was an island. It was... Uh, just on its own. What you need is what I have been calling a system, an innovation system around that. One company cannot uh, do it uh, on its own. You need collaboration with the engineering colleges, you need consultancy services, you need uh, construction companies to come on board and so on, so that you, you basically engage in this space as a collective. This is very much also what the, what the Chinese have done. Was there a part to, to your question that I didn't address? Uh, sorry. Yes. Otherwise, we, we can move on and get back to it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this whole process, the technology transfer is critical. Yeah. Yeah. So are there anything happening on that front? Front. Initiatives, collaborations between the global north and global south. So, can you s say something about that? The prospects and uh, progress so far in that area? Uh, yes. So, there's a lot under the, the UNFCCC uh, climate change agreement uh, about technology transfer and uh, investments for that. Now, the problem is, and, and uh, some of you may know this that a lot of the ideas are there, the, the, the mechanisms are there, but then we need to fill up the funds for, for technology transfer. And here, a lot of the countries that, you know, they, they promise uh, things during the meetings, but don't deliver on those promises. So in fact, uh, the funding is, is not as much as it should be, but they are there. But let me say uh, something else. All of those opportunities that are, are there should be utilized for, uh, for, for green technology transfer. And, you know, if you are thinking about uh, waste management here, I don't know what the specific mechanisms are, but I know they are out there. There are uh, programs for technology transfer in, in waste management that, that you can utilize. So the global dimension of all of this is, is very important. That being said, 
technology is never transferred. It is acquired. What I mean by that is that you, you, you don't uh, expect people to give away their critical knowledge. You, you, you give away certain uh, types of knowledge around the core technologies, but the core technologies are protected. And this is something which is also important to, this, to what I have been talking about, that we need a complete overhaul of the intellectual property rights uh, regime. Um, if we think about some of the mechanisms that were being set up during COVID for, for vaccines, those kinds of ideas have to be transferred uh, to, to, to the green technology space. And there are discussions going ar uh, on around that. But of course, it's a political economy issue, huge economic interest at stake, so it's a difficult one. But there are many, many mechanisms of, of technology transfer. Um, the Chinese were very sensible in the way that the in, they invited foreign direct investments in, into these uh, spaces that I've been talking about. So learning from those foreign direct investments, and they're useful for a time, and, and there's loads of, of foreign companies operating uh, still in China. But the way that uh, the, the policy has transcended from, okay, you are here, uh, you have uh, the, the, the complete market on your own terms, uh, to then uh, later on restricting, building competitors, forging uh, a technology collaboration between local firms and foreign firms and so on. All of these active uh, efforts are there. There's also like licensing mechanisms. Um, there are some learning mechanisms uh, in trade relationships. Uh, and in, in this space in particular, the, the knowledge intensive business services, the small consultancies, they have a lot of knowledge. So in many of these spaces that I've been talking about, in, including biomass, the role of, of European companies that don't have huge interests in, uh, in, in constructing biomass uh, plants as such, but have interest in teaching people how to do it. Huh? Those are the kinds of companies to, to rely on. So the mechanisms of technology transfer are many, and, and we shouldn't just, or you shouldn't just rely on, on, on those that are advertised under the UNFCCC. Not only, it's, it's a, an important mechanism, but it cannot stand on its own. Thank you, Dr. Leva. Um, I, I started uh, in between, I think, but uh, I could understand what you were talking so far, and then your answers to the queries. And the queries it's themselves were also quite strong. So I think uh, thanks for that also to the audience. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, now let us move on to the next uh, speak speaker, Dr. C. V. Krishnan. He will join us through online. So, oh, I mean, and he will talk on price of free food in retrospect is very high. Sir, over to you, sir. No, fine, thank you. Uh, good morning to all distinguished guests and dear students. Uh, I'm online because, not because Sri Lagam Lifelong Learning Institute is in Somewhere else, Sri Lagam Lifelong Learning Institute is in Chef, about 12 kilometers from your college. Uh, I live in Long Island, New York, for the last 56 years. Uh, I want to talk about something a little more uh, easier for us to understand than the difficult topic you heard. These are challenging problems which Dr. Rasmus discussed and it takes a long time. So I thought I'll give you something a little more relaxing before you hear the next speaker. The price of free food is, in retrospect, is very costly. Well, what does that mean? A couple of people asked me, including your organizers, and I wanted to keep it that way to show some amusing examples. First, I was a student at St. Thomas College, your college, 
1953 to 1955. There were no lectures like this at that time. And there was no free tea like what you had today, tea and some snacks probably. I hope you got it. But instead, what we had was, morning we had chemistry lessons. I was a, and Father Suryak will give the lecture and then we go to the lab. And then there is a small room through which we had to get out. And two professors, not they, they were not professors at that time. One was K.P. Anthony, well known to St. Thomas College. We have K.P. Anthony Memorial Lecture every year. And N.P. Damodaran. They were lab demo assistants at that time, lab demonstrators, they were called. They will not let you out until you answer the questions. And the, so that means we have to go back to the lab, do the experiment again, answer the question, and then only you can get out. That means most of the time we had to skip lunch because the lunch time was sent, spent in the lab trying to answer the questions of the, of the demonstrators. And we saved about, at that time, it is not the paisa, it was two and a half an hour, which is about 16 paisa. So we saved on that lunch of 16 paisa, which is about one dosha and one tea from Patan's, uh, uh, Patan's restaurant, which is still there in Trichu town. So that was an investment. We, we made that money, I kept that in my mind. You know, I saved that money on the lunch, thanks to the professors at St. Thomas College. And then in Kerala Arma College, oh, but what did I give back to St. Thomas College? Well, one reason you know you are now having this lecture today because of, partly because of my contribution. I, and also we had, I had contributed for the Nobel Laureates program a couple of years and also to the English department like that, a few donations. That's the meaning of saying the price was too costly compared to the cost of the uh, lunch money I saved, that is 16 paise. In Kerala College, we had two professors again, Professor K. I. Vasu and his brother, Kunyu Nimasha, and we went to his house in Taikadisheri. And he used to give us, they used to give us food, bananas, tea, and also chemistry books. That helped us a lot. In return, we wanted to do an industrial park in Trichur, which it didn't materialize, but somehow we contributed for that Nobel Laureates program in Kerala College. Again, if you compare the price, it is too costly, the food we received. And what is the idea of giving that? When you listen to, to this lecture today with that tea, it is an investment in you. you are, we expect you to return so many times more than the price of the tea you received for a few minutes of your enjoyment. We are investing in you. St. Thomas College is investing in you. The economics department is investing in you. You are, at the time of your tea or coffee, your brain uh, uh, stimulators were accelerating and you had a good time, I hope. And I'm sure I had it. Same thing is true but because of that work in Kerala Orma College, we had an exhibition and we worked for five days. And we had free breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But I had to walk back to Cherp. I come from Cherp Uragam, which is about 12 kilometers. But it was the food that motivated us to do the experiments for the science exhibition in Kerala Arma College. And because of the exhibition, we were lucky to get selected to Homi Baba Research Center. I was a scientist there for 10 years. And we had a good time there. They were very helpful. We used to go for science conferences if you had a research paper. And what do you get at the science conferences apart from learning science? Well, we always had a place like Bombay or Mumbai. We have a governor's party. We have a mayor's party. And if you are in New Delhi, you get even a party at the Rashtrapati Bhavan Gardens. So we had parties in those places. We had parties in Benares or uh, Chandigarh, places in India, Calcutta. In all these places, there were parties in the afternoon. What was that for? Not only just for your enjoyment, but then you go back and work hard and prepare the next research paper. So it is an investment. And that investment pays in return. So the, that it is much more costly than the price of that food we received 
even though it is a partial enjoyment. That is what I mean by saying the price, the food we get is, in retrospect, is very costly. And then in 1957, I left for postdoctoral research. My, uh, I want to tell you my, my field of research was about water and solutions and how to purify water, the chemistry behind demineralizers, physical chemistry of ion exchanges. That was my field. And I got a postdoctoral fellowship to go to Stony Brook University in 1967. And because, because I was in a government job, I had to quit the job in Bombay. And then I stayed in New York all these, all these 56 years. That's why I'm talking from New York. In New York also, in New, Stony Brook University, we have every Friday a professor from another university gives lectures for graduate students and other professors. And what do we have? We have again party, that coffee and snacks. Of course, in, in U.S., sometimes you get even beer instead of coffee or tea, which is a more common drink. But what do they expect? They expect the graduate student to go back to the lab and work harder to prepare for his or her thesis and submit papers for publication. Again, the point is that the free food you received is only to encourage you to spend more time to do work so that the, that's the meaning of saying the price of food is more costly, extremely costly. You don't think about it in those terms. You have a good time at that time, the same way you, you may have a good time about half hour in the morning before you come, come to this lecture series. The same thing is true even when you go for international papers in uh, different places. I have gone to different places in, uh, in Europe, uh, England, uh, France, then I have gone to Korea, Singapore, all for paper research presentation. Everywhere there is party. And the party is only, a, is only a token of appreciation. Then you go back and work harder and you prepare more research papers. That's the, that is the sense I wanted to say that the price of food in retrospect is very costly. It is an investment. And then, since I had received these things, I wanted to give back something in return because I come from a place like Cherp or Uragam and then studied in St. Thomas and Carol Orma. And I, I come from a poor family. I wanted to make sure I give something in return as an educator. I am a teacher. I taught in a school for so many years. I am a researcher with, again, mostly solution thermodynamics and some photochemistry. And after retirement from teaching, 10 years of cancer-related cancer research. Again, working about 15, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, publishing numerous papers and writing book chapters. These are, these are the pleasures I get. But in return, I wanted to give it back to the community that made me a scientist, that made me a researcher. And that's why I started an education institution called Sopanam in Cherpa in 2010. That is 13 years running, not just science, we have got uh, Kadagali there, we have got classical music, we have Zumba dance, actually, and we have yoga, we have karate. It is an educational institution for all age groups, but it has no living facilities per se. So the more recent one is the one Sri Lagam Lifelong Institute, which was inaugurated on August 11. We had five days of celebration. Some of you may have heard about Stephen Devesi, who was the entertainer for the first day. And the, and the second day, we had these competitions for the colleges thinking about lifelong learning cities. Thanks to Dr. Ajit Kaliat, he was going to speak next. I wanted to contribute to our mature learning city. But apart from solving big problems, I have the following question to the colleges. What do you do? Do you interact among yourselves? There are so many colleges in Trishur district. We have to bring them together, collectively think about ideas and work collectively. Not only in any field, take for example in science, you need equipment for doing scientific research. There is no science lab per se in any college, as far as I know, even now for doing substantial good scientific research. 
But if all the colleges pull together, we can have any equipment we want. All students can have a great time with the research. Same thing in any field. And the question is to the colleges is, what do we do if you are a lifelong learning city? What do you do for teachers, school teachers, adults working in different fields, say Kalyan silk sarees or masons or carpenters, or construction workers? What kind of programs do we offer? It is the job of a university, deemed university or a college, to bring all these together and have programs for every spectrum of people in the in our district so that it will be a really lifelong learning center let us not worry too much about the biggest problems but the small problems give education for every group and the new building which i have the so sri lankan lifelong learning institute has facilities for people to stay together at least for a day and, and interact so that you learn more because i uh, last year I gave a talk in, in, a, uh, in a resort at Aratuvara. Some of you may know Aratuvara, Aratuvara Puram. And their high school kids were there before the day of Taipuyam. Taipuyam is a day where children, everybody is supposed to enjoy when poor these kids were coming to this class. So I asked them, on a day like this, I feel pity that you are here. They should have been enjoying the typhoon. I mean, so, you, so I said, did you have a good time with your friends? Yes. Did you sleep? Uh, you, did you talk all the night? Yes. Are you sleeping now in my class? Yes. I said, that is what I want. The children, uh, college students, now I say, you enjoy your life now. Let the elders think about the bigger problems, but you work on the project. You can contribute intellectually now because you are all bright. You can contribute manually because you are young and energetic, not an old man like me who is 86. And you can contribute financially, if possible, when you become a grandparent to the society you live. That's what I did. I have contributed all our wealth for education through Sopanam and through Sri Lakam Lifelong Learning Institute. And I hope some of you will utilize that for educating the whole spectrum of people in our community. Right now, I can think about, I always say I cannot improve America, I cannot improve India, I cannot improve Kerala, but I can try a little bit in my birthplace, which is the Shore District. And I hope these opportunities like this take the lifelong learning is a lifelong experience. Use this opportunity to learn and contribute to your society in whatever way you want. And that contribution, you have, uh, rich people, people say philanthropy. I did not use the word philanthropy. I use the word, the free food is extremely costly. You have to pay it in return. And I hope the money I saved by missing my lunch at St. Uh, Thomas College. Uh, and also, oh, I also wanted to tell you one thing. On, on Wednesdays at St. Thomas College, it used to be civics and ethics which being a Hindu, I, it was not compulsory for me, only for Christians. So I saved 25 paisa or four and ash by walking from Prichur to Cherp. That's also an, another investment as far as I'm concerned from the college. And I have tried to give back all of it as much as I can with all my savings, lifelong learnings, earning to my society back. And I hope we need more people and that can come only through education. And education is the best part that a school or a college can offer to us. So I hope and, and I wish you all the best. And it is, I want to tell you, it is 2.30 in the morning here, which is not my normal time. And it is 9 degrees outside, 9 degrees Celsius outside, 21 degrees inside the room, in my office room, in my house, I'm talking about. Thank you. and um, I have the pleasure of seeing you all because of my education at this age, 86. Except for politicians, can you think of how many 86-year-old people you interact with? Okay, so I got that opportunity because of education, and I thank all my schools and colleges in Trichur for doing me the same. And I wish you also all the best in your life. Thank you.
thank you sir i was about to say that uh, i mean it's uh, that 230 in the midnight is again another thing which i mean uh, you would have forgotten to tell us but anyway thanks a lot i mean that is again it's a motiva a motivation motivation for all of us I mean, thank you sir and uh, i would also have to say good good night also i hope oh good morning you know he has okay. to sleep he has to sleep is to that is no i will listen to all of it okay, thank you thank you sir thank you, okay. sir thank you sir thank you sir in my younger days i used to watch basketball here yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we will move on to dr ajit kaliyath who is the professor urban chair professor at kila on uh, creativity and lifelong learning in trishu actually taking from you sir over to ajit thank you sir okay um respected chair distinguished guests and also the team at uh, st thomas college for inviting me to share my perspective i'm not very sure how many of you are going to agree to me but this is my conviction and i need to present this fix wherever i get an audience to speak about the potential which i found out in the last two and a half years of my um, affiliation at kila and uh, being associated with uh, trishur uh, what i'm sharing is something which i found trishur has got a potential to be not just as a an ecosystem of various learning institutions but also to position uh itself yeah i will use that i'm getting it yeah thank you um not merely as an ecosystem but also something which can get position which can help to shoot to get position as a global hub um we are all of all aware of the disengagement of youth within our society aspiring to fly out look for greater opportunities outside i have lived that life so i can tell you with more clarity and conviction it is one part of life yes we all want to kind, kind of get new experience get new opportunities upskilled uh get avenues for exhibiting and and also uh, proving our metal but it is also important to come back or some way contributed to our own society which would have given us the wings so that's what dr krishnan just finished saying how he did his bit of contributing back to the society uh with the money he saved the knowledge he earned and also his commitment to to the well being of um starting from chair to trishur and to to whatever part of the 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 region that he can contribute so i'll take you through i'll i'll i am asked to finish it in 10 minutes so i'll i'll stick to the time i have some quick points to communicate here so this is something which i want you to kind of relate with uh, all of us are here because we are probably lucky like to to get awakened our creativity in different forms whether we study physics chemistry electronics uh, economics sociology or or statistics our um intellectual capabilities have been awakened on a regular basis and we have a deeper commitment to the self and to to the society to kind of contribute with that and this is going to be the most principal uh, strength which would be in demand greater demand for the next phase of globalization or human development adding to that to my field of knowledge i am basically an urban and regional planner by training so i try to contextualize in that manner urbanization provides a great opportunity to bring people who are creative also to kind of exhibit showcase learn unlearn and co-produce something uh, which will be higher order system 
one of the single most opportunity that people who have been studying urbanization say uh, cities produce provide that opportunity for something called collationability meet and greet people who are of who are peers or who are better informed better equipped there is a constant opportunity to meet and greet and engage with those that's called collationability so cities such as trishur can provide that opportunity and it's the collective responsibility moral social intellectual responsibility of all of us who believe that uh future has to be unpacked with lot of new new ways of uh, promoting creativity and we can't just survive so what i have used here is if we do not really find out the collective socio economic potential of any society we will keep on surviving and that survival after some time will compel people to leave that society they will get stunned and if they get stunned if they don't see new opportunities everything is ordinary i have been being, seeing this ever since i was born and i have been studying here there is no new excitement so i want to try something new and youth is uh, that age and that phase of one's life when one is more adventurous one is more curious one is also more uh, risk taking so people will certainly start looking for newer avenues that is one part of the process but also how do we kind of bring our collective potential and strengthen cities such as trishur which has a range of institution not merely see so if you look here this is also an argument which is coming very powerfully richard Fol florida uh, book on the rise of the creative class where i have used the us cities uh, which was a direct easily available evidence if you look washington dc has got about 48% of its people who are working in the who are from the creative economy we don't have any such studies about trishur we don't know how many people are actually involved in in areas where art and culture were higher order intellectual capabilities are used there are a lot of edu education institutions here professor emmanuel himself said uh, agriculture university health university government engineering college law college uh, and you got um, art and science college achudamenon arts and science college st thomas vimala st mary's and then sri kerala arma college there are also academies such as ours kerala institute of local administration uh, state excise academy fire and rescue has got their own academy kfri is there so there are institutions which are also contributing to lifelong learning some of them contributing to cbl problem based learning because we are constantly seized with challenges to kind of equip our own uh, our own uh, uh, human resources with the new capabilities and new new ways of addressing societal challenges so if we so this is an ecosystem if you look at there are different skills knowledge and type of labor which have gone into create this beautiful experience we all remember it we all want to be part of trishur puram but it's not just about uh, having few elephants coming together or having some artists uh, coming together not just that ensemble there's a lot of preparatory work going into that if trishur could produce this kind of an annual event it is also an expression of the various latent tendencies skills knowledge traditional knowledge and also willingness to 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 part be part of that i think this kind of an opportunity is so unique and it's also important that we understand there is also greater business sense i'm capturing some argument from the the way business is looking at creativity only to confirm that creativity again is the next force which the global economy and the leaders of the global economy and business uh, leaders recognize now if that is a case if you look through the the red colored uh ideas cognitive diversity diversity of thought this is something which is called as the the unique opportunity if we have range of academic institutions teaching researching and uh, also engaging with uh, the citizens uh, with their knowledge it is also 
related to the cognitive diversity. You got agriculture scientists, you got forest economists, you got um, technology, computer science, you got um, uh, forensic expert, you got psychologists, you got public health experts, you got advocates, you got doctors. So all these people coexist in a smaller uh, environment, but the interactions are very minimal, and that's where the challenge. So the effort that uh, uh, St. Thomas College is doing today and also to, to bring other institutions into the into the system should help us to contribute to these situations because the job market is not going to continue in the same way and many of us are looking at studying outside want to get different qualifications and skills are also in response to the knowingly unknowingly you are driven by these pull factors the job market is getting changed there are new skills required there are new jobs coming up sustainability officers, trust officers, bicycle officers, and you know, you, you are going to see new uh, range of new jobs. And it's important that we also understand the need to kind of develop such training and such academic opportunities here, so that students as well as those who are in job also are able to kind of upskill and get equipped for those opportunities. So this is related to urban competitiveness. Every city is trying to be competitive and our endeavor to kind of position Trishur as a learning city, a city which contributes to lifelong learning. Anyone who is from the age of 3 to 90 year old or anyone across the uh, different classes, um, unemployed, chauffeur, cook, security person, to CEO, to politician, to, to uh, any uh, high level official will also need to update themselves. Everybody is in pursuit of updating and learning something new. So if Trishur can position itself, it has secured the title of UNESCO Learning City, but it also need to now operationalize this whole thing. And we will need all of your uh, collective support in making that happen. And that will make Trishur livable. That will also make Trishur something which, which global cities are going to learn and look at. Why, why can we achieve this? How can we achieve this? because we got all this proximity. Geographical proximity, institutions are in close proximity as you know. Uh, there are also a lot of people who are in various fields of knowledge who, who are in the close uh, proximity, which can help them to kind of meet, greet, connect, collaborate, challenge, question, and, and to contribute to the constant generation of new knowledge and, and uh, dissemination of that. Institutions are in close proximity and there are also a lot of people who are uh, who are also uh, uh, enablers, uh, various institutions, uh, whether it is Rotary Club, whether it is Lions Club or, or the Management Association, Architects and Engineers Association, there are a range of institutions who can also come together and they are, they are constantly helping these institutions to come together in different formal and informal systems. Just a glimpse about uh, the uh, learning ecosystem in Trishur. Um, credit to the architecture and planning uh, sco school at uh, GEC who helped us in visualize creating this visual. And it's also an imperative that we can't keep on collecting and copying something from London, New York or Tokyo. We will have to identify the natural growth prospects for Trishur which is very place specific, place based. What are the unique strength of Trishur? How can we develop this as a city which everybody wants to come and live, everybody wants to work, everybody would consider this as a city where there's greater fun. And so we will have to kind of develop place specific, place based policies and the learning city is also an endeavor in that direction. So learning again is not as simple as we think. It's not just sitting in a class, not just subscribing to a course, but it's also, it requires a lot of enablers. It requires a lot of deliberations. It also, there are a lot of barriers and it is important that we constantly work together to create a very mature, um, dynamic eco ecosystem, wherein all these actors, teachers, learners, uh, management, and then bureaucrats, politicians, all in a way, come together and enable the process of inclusive as well as lifelong learning so that city becomes a place where 
we are able to constantly update ourselves. So the UNESCO recognition is also helpful in kind of positioning Trishur as a creative city. Just to share some perspective about the creative economies opportunity and this is something which most of you would be familiar because you have been using this uh, various uh, platforms, whether it is ordering food through Zomato Swiggy, getting your uh, new product from Flipkart or ordering some medicine. We all have been using this and it is collectively called platform economy. If a platform economy can be so powerful and can influence, control and regulate our lives, many times they are not even physically present here. Amazon, with, which has its headquarters in US, has been doing the door-to-door -door service here. We haven't been able to produce relevant opportunities until recently. So it's important that we understand there's, there's greater opportunity in coming together and creativity is an important force and opportunity in doing that. So I'll bring this to an end by summarizing few a few things which I understand. It's a time where there's a lot of opportunity for aggregation. All that we do uh, through Zomato, Ziggy, they came here without any information about who are all living here, but they will be the most updated informant in today, Trishore, because they collect information as we order food, as we order uh, different products from Flipkart, Amazon, Zomato, Swiggy, they all get updated. They know about our behaviors. They know where we are ordering, which are the most preferred uh, dishes, products that we have been ordered. So it produces a collective pattern about the, the way people uh, understand and use different things and that's an opportunity. So collaboration and aggregation is an opportunity. It has its own economic potential. And so itself a city which has got about five banking institutions. Trishur is the headquarters of five banking institutions. Uh, and 30% of India's jewelry gets produced in this town. 70% of Kerala's jewelry gets produced in this town. Um, there are three medical colleges. Kerala University Health Sciences and then Trishur Medical College, Amala Medical College, Jubilee Medical College. All these together is constantly producing churning talent which can also be helpful in looking at the potential of medtech which is an emerging area, fintech obviously and as a learning city we can also look at the prospect of edtech. So an established relationship between technology and new, new areas of specialized knowledge is something which Trishur can certainly look at. If we manage to do that, we will be able to create a city, which I said in the first slide, become a global hub. So Sir Professor Peter Hall, who studied urbanization around the world, a leading scholar in urbanization, uh, said about California of 1960, he used this word called spirit of the place. He said he has never seen any part of the, any other part of the world which is, which <laughs> where he got the same experience, the very unique experience of collaboration. And it's important that we create those kind of opportunity. There are a range of institutions which can help us in skilling, upskilling. And also, as you all understand, the government of Kerala has been starting from the Honorable Chief Minister to various ministers have been constantly calling us in the recent years. Kerala, it's Kerala's turn to be an entrepreneurial economy. We need to kind of look at job, creation of job rather than waiting to be employed. So with all of your excitement, creativity and, uh, uh, and desire to perform, I think it's important that some way you find ways and means to collaborate among yourself with the institutions and with the city administration. If that can happen, I think what I said in the beginning will certainly become a reality. I will close this with, with this statement. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Ajit. Uh, a quick question to Dr. Ajit and then we'll go to Akhil and then we can have another round of questions. Any any quick questions to uh, Dr. Ajit? Or we will take it up after Akhil's presentation also. So over to Akhil. Uh, Akhil is the CEO of WeCan and uh, 
he will talk on intergenerational learning through unesco learning city yes sir most respectful chair uh, dr joy elman sir and other distinguished guests and uh, most vibrant participants of this symposium a warm good afternoon to one and all and uh, <clears throat> first of all i extend my um, sincere gratitude to st thomas college for this invitation and um, obviously i consider uh, the invitation of me in uh, two different contexts and the first thing is that like uh, me representing vibrant community action network and we are the alumni from rajiv gandhi national institute of youth development sri perambattur and which is the one and only youth institute in south asia which uh, providing more social science streams as a post graduation courses and i why i said in the uh, in different con two contexts because i can notice that uh, uh, the uh, like participants those who are here from uh, the various post graduate uh, departments like economics uh, social works and kind of things so definitely uh, this would be an opportunity like for uh, inspire yourself that like the previous uh, speakers said that like what we can contribute to the society that is one of the main major thing like we are from we are alumni from national institute i post graduate from uh, development studies and like we got an opportunity here to work with uh, unesco learning city that's why i said that this opportunities is always open to each and every one those who are pursuing your graduation and post graduation in trishur uh, in different colleges so this is an opportunity we had a wonderful team activating here that give lots of opportunity for each and every individual to give your contribution to this so begin from uh, learning city i can start from that from 1925 itself the concept is here that to trishur want to be mauled as a learning city hub of learning like uh, uh, ruler ramo verma itself coined that in 1925 itself trishur want to be mauled as a learning city and begin from himself he allocated different funds and something uh, like to g promote more and more activities so that concept is already in the soil of trishur and fortunately currently we are giving like the corporation killa and other institutes are giving the pillars uh to this uh, greatest uh, vision that is what is happening currently and before uh, beginning my uh, presentation i want to tell you that like see uh, begin from trishur municipal corporation a very visionary leaders headed by honorable mayor mk wogi sir and other personalities from the trishur corporation has giving a tremendous support and visionary Uh, uh contribution to building trishur as a learning city like from a uh, corporation itself they assigned three uh, councillors uh, they want to be build a learning city as in a different way so they are contributing one of our uh, coordinator is sitting here self advocate willy and heading another from subhi sugumar and uh, anis advocate anis so i am pointing these points continuously that this opportunity is here that each and everyone can what grab this opportunity to be part of the building a learning city and another is that like kila so for being formulating tilakam project i i don't know like uh, we had a different consultation with dr ajit sir like numbers of consultation we are going meeting with him sharing our concept ideas and that ideas like his contribution so this contribution this teamwork has come to the result of this uh, tilakam a comprehensive project so again i am pointing to like my words to all for the participants from the different colleges so who are participating here so this uh, door is also open for each and every one so once again i am repeating that you people can be also part of 
uh, you know scholar learning city as contributing your concept ideas everything and finally like when i am beginning my presentation tilakam here tilakam here i can say that uh, the inauguration of tilakam projects it begin from st thomas college itself so it also be another uh, great thing so i'm wha what is tilakam the tilakam uh, is unesco learning city project we conducted a need assessment from thrissur corporation and on behalf of this need assessment we framed a, com a comprehensive project named tilakam which like uh, we conducted a detailed need assessment in and around thrissur on the basis of this scientific study we come to a uh, comprehensive project named tilakam actually we we build this project in within the five pillars and the first pillar is learn for knowledge and uh, we can say that uh, what what begins from learns for knowledge learn for knowledge we actually in in these five pillars we coined almost 50 funds one sub projects which is going to be support trishu city to be a learning city and first of all when we are going for this learn for knowledge what we meant is what we meant is like to acquiring the knowledge like the change is happening to the each and everyone the trishu residents and already i just told that from the begin from 3 to 19 age group we are uh, compelling like we are uh, what including each and every one to be part of this so under this learn for knowledge we are uh, taking the different academic activities for the school students and others so in in under this the learning facility center and academic clubs these two further things are uh, projects are coming under this learn for knowledge it's begin from different uh, academic clubs science forums uh, social labs uh, like and uh, other kind of learning facility centers kind of things are including this learning facility center and uh, basically i'm uh, once again i'm saying that the concept began this learn learn for knowledge is that to enhance those who really want to acquire knowledge here is the opportunity for support them that is what is we represent in the learn for knowledge pillar and the second pillar is we aim for learn for earning those who want to earn like the different uh, uh, what spheres in our society through earning we we make learn as a what an important content and through that we are uh, uh, what supporting individual to empower the life so in this learn for earning we are com comparing like we are uh, deriving two aspects one is placement facility center and another is entrepreneurship facility center so entrepreneurship facility center like just before i just already told that like this era especially in kerala like we are providing different opportunity to for the entrepreneurship so the main intention of this is that like we are creating more and more entrepreneurs in and around our thrissur corporation so we are giving different and different supports to different individuals those are really aspiring to become a entrepreneur and the placement facility center is that to Occupied each an individual to become a one of the demand uh, demanded individual in the job market. So under this, we are providing different kinds of trainings and other aspects. Uh, each and every individual to become a to able to be a, a placement man. And another thing is learn for upscaling. So learn for upscaling is one of the major and uh, important component in Tilakam you know, uh, uh, means uh, in the Tilakam project, which is that like we have a different individuals in our our society so we are trying to handhold each and everyone whether it will be an uh, auto driver whether it will be a farmer whether it will be a, a what shopkeeper we are giving an opportunity to upscale their talent their uh, uh, opportunities and everything through this upscaling this they can double their what income or skills set and everything that is what is we are expecting in the learn for upscaling in an, uh, under this we have two components that one is finishing school and other is skill hub finishing school is that like everyone can be the part of even professors teachers uh, what uh, 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 like counselors whom are at, uh, then be like is an opportunity to upscale our uh, like our skills 
that uh, really we want, want to be acquire some kind of knowledge and all. Uh, that is what is we are intending to the learn for upscaling. And another pillar is learn for technology. See, technology, without technology, nothing is going to happen in this current era. So the learn for technology skill, uh, like the, the pillar is mainly for to mold each and every individuals to acquire the knowledge that to be practiced in their daily life and all. So under this, we are coming to the two components. One is digital literacy and another is Sunday Lab. Sunday Lab is especially for this AI era, artificial intelligence era. We are providing different and different activities regarding to empower our citizens to be become like knowledgeful in the AI, artificial intelligence and all. And another is digital literacy that is all regarding to acquire the knowledge regarding the digital things. And uh, the fifth pillar is learn for happiness. This learn for happiness is the last, like one of the last pillar. See, uh, regarding with the happiness, open spaces, interactions, greetings and meetings, everything is coming under to the learn for happiness. So we, we all are striving to get the happiness. So under this, we are coined two components. One is happiness lab, another is cultural heritage, which is connecting, close connecting to the uh, what uh, Trishur. So under this, we are coining the different activities, even sports, arts, cultural, and everything is coming under this learn for happiness. So uh, in conclusion, we derived the five pillars, and this through these five pillars, we are supporting uh, Trishur to achieving uh, uh, the biggest tag that uh, learning city. That, that is what is we are intent to giving this. So I, I know that we are I'm running already out of time. So this is what is we had completed here. And uh, among these, so many activities are we are taking and uh, we are going like last three to four months, we are uh, uh, conducted different activities under this banner. Thank you. Once again, a sincere uh, gratitude for the St. Thomas College for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Akhil. So, any questions to all the three speakers, I would say. I'm sorry, I'm going back to uh, Mr. Rasmus Lima. Uh, India is a developing country. And uh, as uh, you have said, there are a lot of developed countries where are new green initiatives are practical. But for a country uh, like India, which is a developing country, our priorities are creation of jobs and assuring food security. So as a supplementary uh, thing, what Ms. Kavya has asked, my question is direct, because uh, we are growing with uh, creating jobs and food security. So in a country like this, how far the new green initiative, which are expensive uh, for a country like this, can we go for an intermediate thing where these things are practical without compromising our basic need for creation of jobs and food security? That's my question one. It's very important that green initiatives are very essential because uh, uh, as uh, we have discussed earlier, uh, the issues of climate change are very challenging. And, uh, you know, Kerala is a country, sorry, Kerala is a state where we are climate neutral because we don't have extremes, both hot and cold. But now we are experiencing the temperature, atmospheric temperature is increasing. And uh, there is a uh, felt need for protecting our climate. The monsoon also is changing. So that is very important. We agree with you with on full terms. This is one thing which, uh, if you uh, cannot answer it directly right now, uh, my request is that uh, you should work out some policy which will help a, a developing country like India without compromising on the basic needs, how we can move forward with the Green Initiative. Myself Ashwin from First PG Economics. 
So my question again is to Dr. Lima. So it's it's kind of not a question, but I kind of feel that it is the economic history or the circumstances that a country has gone through that puts a city, or not, not, not just a city, but a country in, in the particular position that it is. So with, re with regards to India when compared to China, it is an entirely different phenomenon because of the history that it has just undergone. So in regards to this, it has gone through a, a varying kind of, va it has gone through a varying graph as a result of which the, 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 the spectrum of where it stays or the milieu where it stays is entirely different from what other countries are facing. And in this respect, the question that I would like to ask is, as we had just mentioned, every country would have their own technological advancements, their own technological um, uh, upskillings and everything that would be there. But they won't be, uh, but just as you said, they, they won't be able to share their core or the technologies that are staying to their core because it is obviously their arbitrage. But my general question lies in the fact that there would be countries that would be similar to India or some countries that would have somewhat similarities to what India is kind of experiencing or states that would be kind of experiencing. similar things in the future. So why can't all of them just combine to form an act? So I wanted to position again here by saying that the type of jobs are getting changed and uh, so itself the skills. If we are not mindful of those requirements, we are contributing to outflow of our talent. Now to prevent that, he also mentioned that uh, one important aspect when he said about PBLI, I was uh, learning it for the first time, it's a new knowledge for me, but what we have been trying to advocate here is greater connect between within the academic institutions and academic institutions with industry with the local government and that's how we from Kila got involved in this whole spectrum of initiatives because our conviction is that local governments are not going to become entrepreneurial unless and until they understand that there's a, there's a uh, immediate transition required to be done. Now if we hit that um, there are there are multiple avenues emerging. If you look at the additional skill acquisition program government of Kerala has been promoting, community skill parks. There are 16 community skill parks in Kerala. I don't know how many uh, how many institutions are really getting in involved and uh, supporting the, that transition because as I understand many of them are not really being subscribed. Now this is a, an innovation brought by government of Kerala to facilitate those who are school dropouts or those who haven't gone to graduation level can pick up some new skills, be part of the employment market. But they are not ecosystem, they are just islands. 
So it's important that higher education institutions engage with them. There's another tendency coming in. If you look at the number of uh, adult tinkering labs in Kerala is 300 plus. Trishur itself has got about 28 schools, which has got ATLs, Trishur district. Engagement with, with ATLs and the schools which have got adult tinkering labs and higher education institutions, another area. So you, you get a sense what the next generation, the school goers are expecting. What, what do they want? What are the new skills? What are the aspirations? And the curriculum has to be that dynamic document. We, we constantly talk about the master plans in our context that they need to be dynamic. And curriculum has to be dynamic. You can't have something which is taught in 30 years back or 20 years back, still be taught in colleges or universities. So that dynamic dynamism in the curriculum will come only when academicians are open to change and they are willing to take the responsibility that it's my moral and intellectual responsibility to contribute to the return to, to and return to the society by new knowledge. And it that is why we need to kind of work in an ecosystem instead of in silos. Within the department, now you, you did uh, an excellent job here at St. Thomas, bringing three departments together, uh, statistics, social work, and economics coming together. I'm sure it is going to open up some new discourses among three of your departments and within the college also. But kindly engage with the the uh, the doctors kindly engage with the police academy kindly engage with Kela, kindly engage with other institutions in and around Trishur, and then you will see a complete transformation so we stepping out of our comfort and asking ourselves what new things we can offer to the society through academic programs and produce those kind of uh, courses um, engaging with the uh, uh, as a program, engaging with the uh, community skill parks, engaging with um, there's something else called the um, NSDC, National Skill Development Council, which offer about 41 sector, uh, sector specialization. 41 sector skill councils are there established by Government of India. Um, aeronautical engineering, green skills, green jobs, um, then you got uh, hospitality industry, you got uh, um, things related to um, ed techs. So there are a range of things. These are open for us to engage. So higher education institutions need to engage with all these emerging tendencies uh, and then, you know, produce new curricula, new courses. And if that can happen, I obviously that's going to open up new opportunities. That's my argument. And I wanted to be very clear, so I try to make expand it. Thank you. Um, thanks for the questions. Uh, first one, really, really interesting question. And basically, I think we think along the same lines. I, I agree with you. And th the point is this, that even if carbon neutrality is very difficult to measure, I mean, a lot of things goes into the carbon uh, measurement, including also things that happen way outside Kerala. So whether parts of Kerala or Kerala as a whole is, is carbon neutral, I think is something to, to be ex uh, examined. The point is, nevertheless, when we are talking about the green transformation, it's not a moral imperative. It's not for moral reasons. If we look at you know who caused the mess, it's not the global south, it's certainly not Kerala. So it's not for that reason that we are talking about uh, a green transformation. It's for strategic reasons. First of all, I mean, it's, it's a part of solving the entire problem where everybody has to, to uh, pull apart. But those, and, and, and this is, of course, part of the, of the climate change agreement about uh, differentiated uh, obligations. And, and that principle has to be that those who polluted in the first place, those who polluted most, have the most moral obligation, of course, also to clean up. That's, that's not the point. The, the point is that the green transformation is going on and it is going to affect all uh, uh, corners of the globe, I including also uh, this country. Now, the question is, again, how do you do that? How do you find ways? Are there issues around you know, agriculture where you can produce in much more uh, uh, environmentally friendly ways while increasing productivity? That is very difficult to do, but are, are there ways to do that so that you, you can somehow square the circle? Are there then, even as I was talking about, ways to 
build on top of those for uh, agro processing and, and so on. So I agree with you. I would love to study India much more to understand the specific context uh, of uh, of this country, indeed this place, to under to, to inform uh, policy making better. But for me, I mean the the the, the general objectives I, I think uh, are, are quite clear. Um, I was I was thinking about a few issues, you know, which is unique to to India. And I don't know, I mean, I used to work uh, a little bit on, on India uh, back in the day, but it's a long time ago. Uh, one thing um, that I did study at that time was the entire ICT uh, uh, industry, what, what was going on in, in the Bangalores of the world and so on. And I still believe there's a huge potential in shaping the direction of ICT development for, for green transformation. I mean, if the, the globe is going to solve the, the multiple environmental crises, ICTs are going to play an, an increasing and crucial role. I would actually go as far as to say it's impossible without uh, using the most advanced digital technologies uh, available. So again, it's about goal setting and about direction. And, and here I think uh, having projects and initiatives and so on that consciously uh, try to develop ICT sector in, in that direction, I think is important. That's, that was one thing going through my mind. Another thing going through my mind I is about frugality. Uh, India has a, a history of, of frugality, and that frugality has to be taught to the world. Uh, if we are going to deal with all of these uh, crises, then thinking about consumption patterns in, in the rich world has to change. I mean, the, the aspirations uh, for those in the rich world and those who want to become rich uh, um, has to change. And there, I think, you know, India has uh, something very, very important to offer. Just, just a few things. Um, on, on the second, um, second question, again, I, I agree with you. Um, a very difficult question. Why? I mean. What was also the, your, your last question was, why not just share? Yes, this is what we should do. That's why I also was mentioning the issue of intellectual property rights uh, a little bit earlier. Because protecting these technologies that are global public goods doesn't work and, and shouldn't work. So the intellectual property rights uh, regime uh, needs uh, a major overhaul. And then I think you were also talking about kinds of alliances in the global south. And that is absolutely crucial because even though we think we know it's a good idea to share, it's not going to happen automatically. It's a contested issue. It's a struggle. Uh, and that's also a little bit what I meant before, but that you, nobody is going to transfer key technologies to you when they have commercial value. So we also have to somehow uh, think about, uh, and again, that, elite, that uh, relates to intellectual property, the relationship between uh, the commercial value and, and the social value of those. Huh? So we could think about ways of you know, acquiring up. I mean, first of all, say, these technologies have an expiration date. You know, after 10 years, they become uh, public. Other things are about technology banks, so acquiring these technologies, acquiring the licenses, and, and, and distributing. That's, that's another way to do it. But I would say yes. I mean, the global south should come together and, 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 and argue strong and, and forcefully for, for, for this type of, of agenda. A lot of collaboration, though, is not happening at that level. It's happening in the specific projects that we are talking about. And, and here, again, it's a policy issue. And it's about you know thinking, I don't know, as I said, I don't know how the solar power projects were constructed. Uh, 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 in, in the vicinity here, but every project should be thought about as a development, a collaboration project. And too few uh, considerations often go into these projects. So it's just about how can we get the cheapest uh, solar panels? Who's the cheapest provider? But that's not, that, that is important, of course, but what has to be thought about is the collaboration and learning aspects. How do we make sure that those who work on the ground, work with the local colleges, Make sure that we uh, um, 
transfer some of those lessons to uh, municipalities working with this, and so on, so that the projects are not just islands. Uh, last one, I will be brief. Uh, that was about uh, subsidies. Uh, absolutely, and uh, again, uh, there's a major political economy uh, component uh, underlying this. The, the key, of course, is to think about dynamic subsidies. Otherwise, uh, you just have people living off the, or companies living off the subsidies and, and not innovating. So there are ways, of course, to, it's in, 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 in most of these green technology spaces, they're called feed-in tariffs. So the idea is once they, the technologies become competitive, you remove the tariff again. That's uh, how it should work. And in many countries, it has worked like that. So now we have price parity between renewables and, 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 and non-renewables, and therefore the tariffs have been removed. So most energy projects, green energy projects, are on complete market-based terms now in, in most of Europe. Another thing about subsidies is to also think about, uh, rather than the traditional subsidy, fluctuating subsidies, where you basically have a fluctuating market price plus a premium. Uh, so these are some of the ways to, I think, circumvent the issues that you highlighted. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lema. And uh, finally, we are coming to a close of this program. Uh, I don't want to comment upon any of the arguments made here, the presentations made here, because all of you have listened to them, and I don't want to consolidate it again. But I had only two points. One is I understand that you are all from the Department of Economics, Statistics, or the Social Work, social Sociology, Social Work, Social Work. And we have been talking about climate change, greening, renewable energy, and the uh, and whatnot. And uh, I had this suspicion that at least a few of you would have thought, because these professors had asked us to come, and we are forced to. We are like a captive audience, where this has nothing to do with us. We are, we are studying economics, we are studying statistics, we are studying social work, and you are talking about all these things which are Latin and Greek to all of us. Am I correct? But I had to actually, I actually wanted to tell you that a few words and phrases used here. For example, there was a short, uh, Second, uh, uh, one second, uh, this thing on techno economic. You use that term. At least a couple of economics students would have asked, What is this techno economic which has not come to our books and syllabus? I mean, this is exactly what I wanted to tell you. You cannot, I don't know whether I have addressed you earlier. I have already told at least a few other college students, economics people, at least. You, you can't escape economics in any matter in this world. Economics is part and parcel of the existing globe, I would say. Anyway, you go. so climate science itself, climate change science especially, has a lot to do with economics. And if you are talking about these opportunities and potentials which uh, uh, Dr. Lemma mentioned, I will not go into this global opportunities and all kinds of things which you are talking about, the country's opportunities and all. I am only talking about you people, the kind of opportunities you have. At the moment, you are actually thinking about a vac vacancy which might arise if uh, all these people move out in St. Thomas or colleges like ours. That's the usual way in which you have your PG, then you write your net, then you get your try to get your PhD, and by, if you get net, somehow get into this one of these colleges as guest lecturer or if possible at some point of time in uh, before you retire you are into the official capacity also but opportunities are elsewhere and there are plenty of opportunities this climate change science also brings in 
and the policies related to that also breaks in and economics and economists have a lot to do with that but then our statistics friends would uh, actually be a little dejected and depressed you are only talking about the economics people you take that IPCC report it's all about statistics it's all about data who did it I just close it there am I correct it's all these people who, who were supposed to do it in future so there again you are talking about climate change you are talking about uh, energy renewable energy and all kinds of things greening and all kinds of things but your statistician is there and you have an opportunity and then you are talking about the social work I know you are really you are all from the social work department economics who all are from the social work department ok ok see the economics got their share the statistics got their share but then everything happens in this society you are talking about say for example you, I mean, we actually had uh, uh, have actually Kila under the leadership of Kila at least around 2000, uh, 260 local governments in Kerala had done the local action plan on climate change we developed the methodology tools and then we did the local action plan on climate change and also we prepared the local we not the local governments prepared the local development uh, disaster management plans and some of the local governments also do the carbon neutral local government and uh, okay and then our the low carbon pathway and who does the, all these things we had the young so called environment science environmental engineering disaster management people as well as the social work people because if you look at the local action plan on climate change and the disaster management plan it has everything and when we also do that field studies because these are all done in the field where we have something called the focus group discussions talking about what has happened over the years and all or the key informant interviews or uh, preparing other social I mean, uh, social interaction and participatory research methodologies I am sure many of this uh, physics and uh, chemistry and other people who would have been working on this climate science or the environmental science people would not have even heard of this kind of participatory rural appraisal and participatory rural methodologies and participatory um, and to, uh, tools or as field study field I mean focus group discussions the key informant interviews how do you do who knows that it's the social work people who might be knowing it better so what I am trying to say is that everyone has a greater opportunity at this point of time when you are actually even for the energy renewable energy kind of thing so there are actually opportunities for every one of it but only difference is that the way we learn now will not suffice that's what Dr. Ajit was talking about see we have this knowledge focus but then we have also moved into the skill focus and there is nothing like a permanent portfolio or job or protocol you mean every 10 years you will have to diversify and where your basic foundation is the knowledge and skills which you develop and from the curriculum and the syllabus and all how you are actually groomed to have these skills and finally it is also about attitude if you are actually thinking only about the way I said then you are there but if you are actually looking at the skies then the difference is there and then there are plenty of opportunities and uh, that's where I would actually take you to that is what uh, Dr. Krishna also was mentioning and uh, Akhil has been the champion as well as an evidence of see he learned development study he studied development studies so it can cover everything but then what is he doing now he has ventured into something which nobody else has done so that is the that is the way one actually gets groomed to take up actions activities and that is where the learning city provides you an opportunity in Trishur whatever you have developed whatever uh, Dr. Ajit and others have developed in the corporation but then finally it is for you to actually 
grasp it and get it and uh, that kind of enthusiasm has to come from you definitely this has been the most uh, correct way of putting things together you had the economists the statisticians and the social workers together when I mean, that also points to the future how we can actually work together especially for learning city as well as learning city is not for getting the name for the thrissur city but it is for the people here the youngsters here and make use of that by involving in it so thank you all it, i i it had a, i had a wonderful uh, session here i would say because it came initially when i was looking through the program and i even told uh, ajit also what is this so many things coming in one program you are talking about greening and other things uh, dr krishnan is talking about food and the kind of food i never expected this food this was i mean he said it is actually the i mean he will actually talk about something very simple than dr lema but i thought the kind of uh, insight he had provided is more stronger than whatever science you would have actually told it is actually from the field and practice and from the heart and then about learning city and how it went so it was actually coming together as a single piece as a I mean, this thing so as uh, that also worked well i think thank you all thank you for sitting like this I mean, as dr krishnan said i should have expected people to talk i should have expected people to sleep i mean i mean that also that will also have happened i mean anyway that also didn't happen probably that that also we need to consider anyway thank you all uh, for being uh, so attentive i don't think you will find uh, dr lama you will find this kind of students sitting through this 3 hours I mean, without even moving i mean something like <laughs> not even blinking <blame. laughs> but then you had also wonderful questions thank you for that thank you all thank you sir uh, we are coming to the concluding part of the symposium i request our executive manager father biju panin kadin to gift our mementos to the distinguished speakers uh, father please i would like to invite invite dr rasmus lima to please receive this token of appreciation on behalf of the organizing committee we also have a small token of love for ms tina lima ma'am uh, i hope you enjoyed your stay in kerala god's own country I would like to thank Dr. Joy Ilaman. Dr. Ajit Kaliyat. And Mr. Vikil Akhil Kurian. I invite Mr. Jiju Kuruvela, Head of Department of Social Work, for the for formal vote of thanks. I know that the time is exceed. We will wind up the program within two minutes. Formally, I need to express my our great sincere gratitude to the chief guests and speakers. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you. especially i extend my sincere appreciation to our distinguished guests and speakers for sharing their knowledge and insights with us on behalf of organizing committee and the management of our college i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to dr rasmus lema for gracing us with his enlightening session on green windows opportunities for late comer development it has been a truly enriching experience and we are honored to have had the privilege of listening to his insight on this crucial topic thank you thank you sir 
And I also thank you uh, so much for Ms. Uh, Stina for joining with us. We are so happy to have you with you. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Joy Elliman, our esteemed symposium moderator, for his exceptional contribution to making his even resounding success. Dr. Elliman, your dedication, insightful guidance, and seamless management throughout this symposium have been truly commendable. Thank you, for, uh, sir, for your valuable time and expertise. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It is with great pleasure that I propose what of thanks to our distinguished resource persons, Dr. Krishnan C.V., Dr. Rajit Kaliyath, and Mr. Rakil Kurian. Your contributions to our knowledge is deeply appreciated. Thank you for being with us today and for enriching our understanding for these vital subjects. We are grateful for your time, expertise, and inspiration you have provided. Thank you once again for your valuable contribution to these sessions. Thank you. On behalf of organizing committee and all the participants, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to respected executive manager, Reverend Father Biju Panagaran, and principal, Reverend Dr. F Martin Columbreth, and the college management for their unwavering support and guidance. I also want to thank, uh, acknowledge the hard work and dedication of our organizing committee and volunteers representing the Department of Economics, Statistics, Social Work, and the Social Action Club, who have put in tireless efforts to make this event a success. We appreciate the meticulous planning, attention to detail, and the seamless coordination that has been evident throughout the entire process. Thank you, the entire organizing committee and team. I would like to express our sincere thanks to uh, Sri Lagam Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, Globalix, uh, Kerala Economic Association, Vijnan Sagar, Cosford, and the uh, UNESCO Learning City team for their unwavering support. Your collaboration has not only made this event a success, but it has set a high standard of future endeavors. We look forward to continuing this fruitful partnership and achieving even greater milestones together. Last but not least, uh, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the colleges and institutions present here today for making this symposium a resounding success. Your active participation and valuable contributions have enriched our event. Thank you once again. And we look forward to continued collaboration and participation in future endeavors. Thank you once again, dear dignitaries and participants. Thank you. Thank you all. Once again, thank you all for being with us today. Your presence made this event a success. Uh, please note that the snacks are available outside. Please do help yourself before leaving.